Okay, uh, my name is Odie Hawkins and this is the second in a series of programs that Zola Selena Hawkins and I will be doing over the course of the next month, over the course of this month, January. Uh, yesterday was our first, I want to call it session, this is the second session. Uh, I can't think of a better word other than that at the moment. But what I'm doing is making an effort to introduce uh, a public who may not previously have known a lot about me or my books. And I'm uh, really, you know, giving a little hustle here, legitimate hustle, that has to do with these books. I'll be getting to these books as time goes on, as the month goes on. But there are a number of things that have to be covered first. First of all, I always have to mention as I did yesterday, uh, something about this sister here, Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who saved my life, and I'm sure she saved a lot of people's lives too, when she made me go to a creative writing class. I'll fill you in on that in a minute. But uh, after yesterday's session, I got calls from a few interested people, friends. Oh, let me interrupt everything. Interrupt Flash News. Here's a shout out to Alfred Reeves. Ralph, Alfred. Alfred. <laughs> You'll like that. Uh, Alfred, uh, we've held your place open and when you return we'll resume having Cognac Wednesdays. <laughs> but uh, the news that we've gotten is good and so uh, Keep on, keep on doing it. Okay, going back to the to the narrative. We started off in high school. I was about 15. I came into Jim Sample High School after having uh, wandered and blundered through 17 grammar schools. So it was quite a uh, a feat to be in one school for four years. I was at Dusable for four years, and despite the rumors, I did graduate. <laughs> I did graduate. In my first year at Dusable, 1952, ancient history, ancient history, my first year, I became a, a paid writer. Up to that point, I had scribbled stories, I had maybe even written a novel or two without knowing what I was doing, and in most cases, I just gave whatever I wrote away to somebody. Uh, at DuSable in my freshman year, a friend of mine named Horace uh, found himself being overwhelmed by the attractions of a young lady. And at that time, it was, you know, the norm for a young guy, young man, uh, who felt the thunderbolt, bam, to write a note. You know, people were singing songs. There I go, there I go, there I go, there. Pretty baby, you are the soul of that my control. It's such a funny thing, but every time you're near me, I never can behave. You give me a smile and then I'm wrapped up in your magic. There's music all around me. Crazy music, music that keep calling me so very close to you. Turns me your slave. You know, singing. I mean, uh, uh, we used to learn songs like that in order to push this love poetry out that we were involved with doing. Horace didn't know how to write. He said to me, you know, I really like her. I really want to meet her. So, you know, drop our note. That's what you do. People folded up notes and dropped them in the little air vents of, of the would-be liked ones. And if she was responsible, it was almost like a little mating game, you know, like you see in the in the Amazon forest or something. <laughs> the tweaky tweaky bird leaves a little bobble, and if the female likes it, she turns it over, and the rest just goes on. He couldn't write a sound writer for me. I didn't think about it a lot. I just wrote some. I did this. Understand? I did this for three years, so I'm starting off on a on a. If there's a statute of limitations, uh, 
I hope that it's still has has become outmoded because some of the things, at least one of them, I confess to, was uh, a crime. <laughs> naughty. But we'll get to that. I was naughty. just a naughty. I was just a naughty boy. <laughs> anyway, I hope to know uh, uh, Horace wound up becoming sweethearts with the sweetheart, and I was off. Somebody else asked me to write a note. I was a freshman, and uh, I was doing a whole bunch of things wrong, including swinging from the the struts behind the basketball frame from one to the other, like Tarzan. One afternoon, it fell and cracked my right ankle, broke it, and so I wound up being out of school for a semester, which I had to make up at the end of my four years, which meant rather than go through four years of high school, I went through four and a half years. So I got more high school than most people. I thought I'd say that. So somebody can understand why it is that I graduated in June rather than January. Wrote to note, several other people got in touch with me. I said, well, wait a minute. You know, I live in the Alamo Hotel, the home of, of uh, infamous hoes and, and lazy pimps. I know how to make money. You know, why shouldn't I make some money off of it? So, I started off doing that. I started off writing uh, for friends who wanted notes. We kept it underground. We kept it underground, which explains why my name is now considered by some people the underground master. It goes back to high school. Uh, I wrote for boys, except in several rare instances I wrote some notes for girls. I wrote notes I did a one that I considered generic. That was the two dollar note. I wrote the special. That was three dollars. I wrote the exotic. The exotic, that was four dollars. And then I wrote the outrageous. So I had a nice tier going on. Generic, special, exotic, outrageous. I did that for three years, and I'll save, I'll save the story of how I was stopped from doing it by circumstances beyond my control. That was the beginning of my life as a paid writer. I, it, it triggered something in me. I understood that, uh, as Muhammad Ali used to say, writing is fighting. I started writing could be money. So I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. Uh, I wound up in my third year. I was in Dr. Burroughs' class, Art 101. She taught everything, 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 including art. And she happened to find me trying to catch up on my clientele with an outrageous note. I was writing an outrageous note. She tweaks over my shoulder and picks up the note. I'm embarrassed. Everybody around me knows what's happening. Uh, she read it. She kept me after class. She wrote the number and the times for a, a creative writing class being uh, conducted, directed by a white woman named Margaret Peterson at the Baptist Institute on 51st it was called South Parkway and it's been changed to King Drive. And of course, I was forced to go because Dr. Burroughs made me understand that if I did not go, she would fail me. And, you know, wait a minute, fail me at Art 101, what's that? So I went. I went for a period of time for some months for the school uh, uh, vacation that year the summer vacation, she gave me a ream of notebook paper and I wrote, I believe, uh, my first novel that summer. No outline, no character sketches, none of the stuff I bore people about in my writing workshops. But I wrote it and uh, it was stolen by a jealous young female and I'll leave that go at this point, bringing us 
right up to now. That was then, right up to now. Bring us right up to now. I have some 30 published books at this point in time and about 30 unpublished books. So we'll begin to uh, balance the scale. I want to overbalance it so that I'll have more sold books than unsold books. One of the books I'd like to introduce you to before we start talking about this bad boy and his horse. One of the stories I'd like to introduce you to is a recently published book called Ancestral Meridians. Ancestral Meridians can you see my ancestral meridians here? I'm zooming in on it. There it is. Lovely, lovely. Okay. Ancestral meridians. Please tell me more. Ancestral meridians are, strangely enough, the novel, which is a sort of short novel, the novel comes from and from the experience that I've had with acupuncture. For those of you who've had acupuncture, you know that it can do marvelous things to uh, uh, cancel out pain and so forth. I think the general understanding is that it doesn't absolutely cure anything. What it does is enable you to bring forth your, your, your best endorphins or whatever it is that's used to help uh, solve the problem. I first had acupuncture in 1978, 79. Uh, I was going to Taekwondo uh, and I was paralyzed one night by one of the kind of things they do to you in Taekwondo, which is kick you a lot. I'd been kicked a lot. And the next morning I couldn't, I couldn't kick. <laughs> I couldn't move. Uh, the master, Young Kyo Kim, and his uh, assistant, Raymond Da Silva, Portuguese, Korean guy, he would have made Bruce Lee sweat a lot, I'm telling you. They sent me to uh, an acupuncturist named Dr. Pilro, John Pilro, and he had me squeeze in to the door. I felt like the man was x raying me. And he put me on the table. He didn't speak English, I didn't speak Korean. But we solved the problem by having me shade in what was wrong. It was my whole back, no problem. I was sprawled on this nice clean table and he proceeded to put little acupuncture needles in. They do not hurt if they're done right. Those who've had it done right, Zola, when you go to see uh, uh, Dr. Jewel Williams mm -hmm. every other week. What's <laughs> it's the not feeling? that often, but okay. Uh, it's it's beautiful. It's uh, she has a very gentle, feminine touch, and uh, I take a vacation on the table. Okay, you're not going for any particular. No, uh, I'm uh, working on my legs for uh, my track so that uh, I can. Uh, uh, start doing my track practice this year and uh, she'll check my tongue and whatever and tell me something might need to be worked on a little bit more and she works on that. that can, that's acupuncture. Mm -hmm. uh, for me the first treatment took me into a, uh, a state of bliss. Mm -hmm. I was on a plane of just just pure, not not pleasure, but uh, solemnity. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I had no worries, no hurts, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. and everything. It was black. It was like being put into a beautiful black hole. I suspect it might be something like what happens when uh, you're in your mother's womb, but everything is cool and Very you don't much have so. any problems and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, that was my first experience with acupuncture. I have to say something about the cover. This cover was done by a very fine Korean-American artist named uh, Mrs. Song Hee, uh, Song Hee Hong. Yes, let me zoom on in a little bit more again. I talked to her about the experience 
And this is the cover she gave me. It's, uh, it's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. It would take yeah. a minute or two to explain what it is she was doing. Down at the bottom, we have acupuncture needles. Mm -hmm. Long, long ago, they used to make acupuncture needles out of bone mm -hmm. and out of uh, stone, according to the, the history of it. Mm -hmm. She went up to, in my, in my reverie, in my abyss, mm -hmm. I found myself in ancient Egypt, when the pyramids were being built. Mm -hmm. I don't say that this happens to everybody, and I'm not suggesting that uh, psychedelic things happen because you take acupuncture, but maybe psychedelic things happen because you are psychedelically inclined. <laughs> and that is not to say that I take LSD or PCP or any of that. Mm -hmm. I really think that sometimes I'm out there because I'm just out there. Yes, most definitely. Right, and, thank you for agreeing with me. Okay, of course, the wife should know. Uh, and a and, uh, person can look up the cover and the purchase of the book on um, by just Googling your name or Ancestral Meridians by Odie Hawkins. And um, that's how the book can be purchased on Amazon oh, okay. or that's your local bookstore. She, was, she struck me with this one. <clears throat> within the novel itself, mm -hmm. I'm taking us, uh, without taking you through the whole story, I, I, I'm taking us through a time when uh, we had slavery, apartheid in America. Not apartheid. Apartheid came later with Reconstruction. This was slavery. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who escaped from slavery, there were many, was a man named Henry Box Brown, who uh, had himself a box built and managed to mail himself, or uh, have the help of uh, some, some white abolitionists in Richmond, Virginia, had himself nailed into this box and was shipped from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia. Uh, that Horace Cart, Potomac River, Railway, Philadelphia. I mean, the trip was supposed to have taken something like 30 some hours. I actually had a box built. I think he must have been a small, stocky guy like me. And I was in the box approximately 30 seconds, and I screamed. <laughs> His, the first, the mini scream, please let me out of here. <laughs> so he was doing something that was amazing. The story is placed inside a, an institution of healing. I'm calling it the Society of Healing Martial Arts Academy, mm -hmm. Soma. Mm -hmm. And it mimics uh, at least one other organization in this city, which practices the same uh, healing procedures. Soma School of Healing Martial Arts, with Dr. Daniel Hoover, and his uh, friend and also fellow doctor, not in that facility, but Dr. Jonathan Lynn. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to say that the book is uh, on the bookshelf at Soma and that they didn't hate it <laughs> when it was done. Okay, now, what goes on with the writer who has 30-some published books and is known by those who know him but, are practically, but is practically unknown by other people? I'm thinking about the, the reception I get from, starting with the A from Africa, for example, when we do a, a YouTube and our friends in, in West Africa, Susan Amagashi, uh, Kojo Yanka, uh, Leonard Kofi, Kofi mm -hmm. Leonard Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, Ed, uh, Reverend Edwin O'Forty Ba, mm -hmm. uh, Pawnee, mm -hmm. Aziji, uh, just a whole host of people. Uh, and then, you know, my Chinese friends, uh, and then the people we know in South America, in Europe. Did I miss anyone? Think so. Anyway, we hear from them, and it sort of uh, is mystifies me as to why people say, why is it that I don't know you? <laughs> well, I don't know. Sometimes it seems that America is one of those places is the last to know about a lot of things that everybody <laughs> knows everything and knows something about. Uh, certainly that's not totally the case with me because I've had the opportunity to write novels and screenplays and radio shows and 
short stories and a whole bunch of things over over the last 50 years. Plus you've been in a couple of documentaries. Well, that too, mm -hmm. but only for my 15 seconds of, okay. you know, your cameo. I, I, wouldn't, I, I wasn't the star, I think Denzel yeah. Washington was. <laughs> okay, your cameos, okay. Well, anyway, uh, hopefully, hopefully, the presentations we make over the course of this month will alter the feeling of being unknown. Mm -hmm. Well received, but unknown. <laughs> you know what I'm about to say. I know, now don't go there. <laughs> so we'll leave that alone for a minute. Mm -hmm. We'd like to close this, this particular session off by introducing you to something that has happened in our lives. I'm talking about Zola Selena, the photographer, and myself. The first thing I'd like to do is acquaint you with what it is that you've been looking at sitting right in front of me. Zola, will you join me? I certainly will. You and Mr. Man on the Horse. She's going around backstage. <laughs> I'm sitting here on the stage. Zola's mother recently died. We talked about it in our first show. At 92, she was she was a wonderful lady, and I really enjoyed her company. I, I hate that it was such a short period of time. But uh, she left us. She left us some African art artifacts that had been given to her by various groups in West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and these pieces of work were given to us, mm -hmm. to the daughter and to the son-in-law. Uh, I, I think it's kind of unusual when a son-in-law can say, I really adored my, my mother-in-law. You certainly did. She, okay. was, she was a wonderful woman. Well, her and her mate. Dr. Ron, uh, Dr. Ron Gray, uh, one of the world's eminent psychiatrists, you know, is... Uh, Fantastic he, voice. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, he's, 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 great. A real minch. he's a real mensch. He's a real mensch. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we only show one of these pieces at a time. Mm -hmm. This particular one is a soldier going off to war. If you... If you try to pick it up, there's only one person in the known Western world I know who can pick these things up, and it's a young man named Russell Lake III. <laughs> he actually picked these up. You can't see the rest of them, but we'll get around to them as the month goes on. Mm -hmm. He picked them up, drove across the country, and deposited them here. With his wife, Tanya. With his wife, Tanya. Tanya Don't don't yeah, she time. helped wrap them so everything worked out so nicely. They did all of that. Mm -hmm. What will happen eventually is that we will uh, have these for our own enjoyment for a while, and then we'll donate them to some museum, mm -hmm. and it'll be the, the Queen Jewel collection. Her name was Queen Jewel Gray. I mean, her name was Jewel, Dr. Jewel Gray, mm -hmm. but I, I coined her Queen Jewel because she had that in her. And everyone who knows her knows she's quite a queen. I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you were talking yesterday about what creates for you a good photograph, uh, what makes, what makes a, a good picture happen in your mind that you want to capture on, on film, that you want to capture in the camera. Well, there's so many events that uh, I think over a lifetime that I've observed um, you know, the smile of my grandmother looking down at me when I was sick, the concern upon her face, the uh, arch of my grandfather's eyebrow when he was a little annoyed because I'd done something I was not supposed to do, like paint the chair in my yellow Sunday dress. Little things like that from the past, and even today, things that I see that I'm like, I want to capture this moment. You know, um, it's not just for me, 
is for others to see. Okay, here's a question if I could stop you right. Why is it that you can have 10 people mm -hmm. just step over something and the 11th person who has the kind of uh, eye for detail and perception that, that you have, why is it that that person will, will reach over and look closely at it or take a picture of it or write a story about it? How does that happen? I think it's, you know, everybody has their own perception of what's important. Um, that in the back of the head, but my grandmother, when... What, what did she do? <laughs> boom, on the back of the head. <laughs> With a, did you see that? <laughs> like, I see it now. So she taught you to have attention to the table. <laughs> yes, yes, she did. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, like I said, that sometimes, you know, people's expression, um, like your grandson, uh, Gregory. He, Gregory, yeah, uh -huh. he had a uh, thing, he said that uh, Belle, his wife, was lifting up his hand, and he took a picture of her holding his hand up, and that was a special moment, a moment that they can enjoy in their 80s, okay, remember Belle when you used to do this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and just the, the gentleness, even, you can see the softness of her hand lifting his hand up, it was beautiful. And so, okay, well, the other question I'm interrupting you, but yeah, how did how is how can we prevent people from taking all of these really dreadful photographs that they take it just because photography has not become a mass medium? They what? are entitled, well, and I would say I would beg to Dr. Ronald Gray that if this is going to keep people calmer than what they normally would be. Let them take all the photographs they want. However, I, you know, I don't believe in raining on anybody's parade. Somebody will like their photographs and somebody won't. Somebody will like my photographs and maybe some won't. But it's okay because there's a diversity in this You're world. so nice. <laughs> it's a diversity. So <laughs> the yin and yang of this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Listen, we're going to get out of here. All right. But uh, this is the second in a series, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be, uh, you know, pushing at you a little bit to buy one of the books I've written. Mm -hmm. If you happen to see some some value in it, some validity, some something that you gained out of it, tell a friend to buy one of these books. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go through the titles right now. We will be doing that one after another in addition to taking you on to another piece of superb West African art. art. Fantastic. How do you take a, this is, this is, I believe this is iron. Yes. This is it. iron. Mm -hmm. I know they use something like a uh, lost wax iron process. I don't know how it works, mm -hmm. but what, how you come out with something like this is incredible. Mm -hmm. I'll have to ask my friend uh, Dale Mm -hmm. who, who uses a, a torch mm -hmm. to make things like this. Mm -hmm. But that's real advanced technology. Oh, we were about to go. Oh, wait a minute before we go. Yes. Okay. Odie Hawkins books can be purchased on Amazon and uh, Barnes & Noble. All you have to do is say you want the book or books by Odie Hawkins. And they're also in several libraries. And also his radio plays can be seen or can be purchased on the internet. And I think that's about it. You see why I love her? I love you too. I love you more. Uh, yin and yang, darling. <laughs> yin and yang. <laughs> I'm going to go now. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, look at this. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Yes, ciao. 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 And so that's the way it comes to the end on this Thursday night. Was it Friday? Thursday. When the New Year's happens in the middle of the week, it's kind of befuddles me. But one of the things we do know is that the evening has come to the end, and we look forward to getting together with you tomorrow. On this new decade. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Ashe. Ashe.